Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session for the Alliance for Industry Decarbonization. As several of the sessions started late and ended late, the same happened to us, and we've been waiting for some of the speakers to attend. They're now all here, so um, great welcome to many of the, all of the panelists. We have an opening speech, and I'd like to invite Mrs. Gauri Singh, the Deputy Director General of IRENA, to hold that opening speech. So good afternoon, all our distinguished partners, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to be here for this session on uh, Alliance for Industry Decarbonization. This uh, is uh, an area that has really gone up very high on our priority because, uh, uh, you know, when we started off about uh, two years back, this was still very much of a new concept, but since then, what we've seen is that this being a very industry-led alliance and uh, a very, you know, it's grown very organically, we have seen a very strong partnership and stakeholding that has come into it. So with more than about 30% of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions and uh, nearly 40% of global energy consumption coming from the industrial sector, uh, this is naturally one of the larger emitters, and uh, which is why it becomes extremely important to address some of the challenges that uh, come with the decarbonization. So uh, while we do see an increase in demand for both energy and industrial products, so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not even that we're looking at doing a kind of a substitution for the kind of energy we have. It's a growing demand, so we have to think very actively on how the emission reduction targets um, within the industrial sector can keep pace with limiting the global temperature rise. This uh, segment of uh, industry decarbonization represents the next big transformation that needs to happen across different sectors. And uh, the kind of growth opportunities that technology advances, new sustainable revenue streams and all offer, I think there is this huge potential to create many, uh, many sustainable and um, good jobs for, for the large number of young people who are looking to come into uh, and come and make sustainability as part of their um, their trajectory. But if this has to happen, then we're also very clear that the markets and business have to be prepared to undergo significant and fundamental changes, which, you know, which as you all know, requires leadership and also commitment. Um, we, we are seeing a rapid emergence of cost-effective renewable energy and green hydrogen is also a segment that uh, we hope is is, stung, is is you know is starting to take shape in terms of actual uh, actual projects getting on the ground but with energy transition technologies energy efficiencies these are actually allowing countries to think of very clear trajectories of switching away from carbon emitting sources and at at a pace that we want to see um, and uh, moving to ambitious renewable energy targets will require proactive regulations, new standards, new market rules and collaboration, all of which are, I know, under discussion in the various groups that, uh, uh, that are led by this uh, Alliance for Decarbonization. So um, I would like to welcome all our partners here uh, the ecosystem knowledge partners, the members of the Alliance for Industry Decarbonization that are here today, and, uh, and would encourage them to collaborate to accelerate the net zero ambition and the decarbonization of industrial value chains as we pursue our effort to be, in, uh, be aligned to the Paris Agreement. Irina, as the host of the the Alliance Secretariat will continue to provide coordination and analytical support. 
and um, I just want to also highlight here a recent publication that we released on green hydrogen for sustainable industrial development, a policy toolkit for developing countries. This uh, report highlights that green hydrogen production can create domestic value and jobs and also enhance international competitiveness through local manufacturing of related technologies and infrastructure development and has the potential to attract foreign direct investment into the domestic industries. IRENA is also finalizing a report on uh, technology pathways and enabling measures to decarbonize hard to abate sectors for the G7. Uh, and this report really focuses on the decarbonization of uh, the hard to abate sectors in industry and transport and elaborates the technological pathways and systemic innovations that are needed to decarbonize five of these sectors, which is iron and steel, chemicals, petrochemicals, road, freight transport, shipping, and aviation. And I know many of our partners here come exactly from these sectors. So um, we, as, as a group, uh, have a responsibility to make sure that the, that the world that we, uh, 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 that we move ourselves into is much more equitable and sustainable. And I'm confident that the dialogue and the discussions today will, uh, will help us coordinate actions from industrial stakeholders across public and private sector and uh, make it a very productive discussion here today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And now I invite Safar Samadov to give a bit more background about that. Good, thank you, David. First of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone, partners, members of the Alliance, ARENA members, dear delegates. It's my pleasure to present you the work that we've done over the last uh, year and also to give you outlook uh, of the Alliance for the future. The Alliance was launched in the September 22, so it's relatively a uh, new platform. It's uh, growing very rapidly. We have uh, members from different sectors, from different countries coming in and really working across hard to abate sectors, taking advantages and learning that we've made in the energy sector to other sectors that need to decarbonize. Over the year, the Alliance is made operational. We have uh, members who work on their decarbonization strategies and working on project implementations on the ground. So what is really added value of the Alliance, it's really industry driven, industry implemented. As members decarbonize, they also help their countries to decarbonize. And also the companies that attend and participate in the Alliance show the way to other companies. And we hope more countries and more uh, companies from these countries will follow the lead of the members. So where do they work? There are six pillars, we call them, three related to technology, one on renewables, the second one bioenergy with carbon capture, utilization and storage, green hydrogen. There is a one pillar on the process related to the heat optimization integration. And in other two, we call them enablers because without people, engineers, technicians, it's not possible to drive decarbonization. It's a human capital. And then, uh, of course, access to finance is really important. The members, as I mentioned, come from different uh, sectors. We have quite a fine uh, balance of the members uh, of, of industries, also energy sector. Uh, there are a number of the important ecosystem support partners. Those organizations have a knowledge, skill, experiences, and able to help uh, the members uh, to decarbonize. The ambition of the Alliance is to grow over the years into the global scale. We currently now stand at 67 members and partners in the Alliance. Now, it's important that the last year Alliance step up. 
was the meeting of the CEOs at the COP28, which adopted decarbonization commitment. That it was historical document as members agreed to increase production of clean energy, also increase uh, offtake and use. The demand side is really important to, to support the sector. Uh, reduce emissions related to scope one, two, and three, and also increase the investment portfolio in their companies. Now you see the joint targets, quantifiable targets adopted the, by the Alliance. And these are very impressive figures because we're going to almost triple in terms of renewable capacity. And we have to discuss how much do we need efforts to do to make sure it is tripling and it is beyond uh, the tripling. Uh, the members going to reduce emissions uh, in uh, score one, two, three, above average uh, level that they call by the national community by 2030. You will see significant jump in terms of the projects related to the carbon capture utilization storage because some of the members moving from the pilot projects into commercial applications. So you see a huge increase in this technology as well. Finally, the uh, human capital reskilling and finance also very important targets because now we're going to increase uh, from a fraction of the retrained uh, technicians, engineers to over 90% of, of staff of these companies to be retrained. And you can imagine the, these companies employ hundreds of thousands of people. So it's overall the 100,000 in one company. Altogether, the alliance represents several hundred uh, and millions uh, employees over. So it's a huge program on retraining uh, the, the capacities. And uh, there will be significant increase in terms of financing will jumping from 90 billion to 50 billion by 2030 to implement these projects. Last year was hugely successful. We've done a lot of progress on all key pillars uh, of the Alliance. We have uh, six working groups. They are led by the members of the Alliance. Uh, they work on the key priorities and actions realized of the last year. There are four analytical reports with specific recommendations for the governments coming from the Alliance will be published in the next two months. We've done on the number of the knowledge sessions uh, capacity building sessions. The Alliance was present at the all uh, global events throughout 23 to outreach, to share experience and to bring uh, new members into, into the cooperation platform. One of the deliverables is very important. Uh, it's called My Change. It's a digital application to help the members to educate and support their staff reskilling on decarbonization and sustainability. As I mentioned it, we're coming with specific digital tool that could be used by Alliance members. What is interesting that all members are able to contribute their experiences into the tool. So make it available uh, to other members to learn from the uh, experience, successes, and maybe failures of other companies. Now the next year and the years to come, the Alliance is going to stay focused on the uh, uh, six uh, key pillars. There is a plan of action that has been discussed since the beginning of the year uh, under the leadership of the leads and the two co-chairs, the program of work is, has been compiled. You can see on the screen key activities. I will not going to go through them, but under each working group, there will be key activities. They range from the enterprise twinning platform to connect enterprises all around the world that they can work together to looking at the technology side uh, looking at the, what kind of incentives are needed uh, to advance uh, decarbonization project, looking at the solutions, how we can go faster in terms of the heat optimization, looking again at the educating, uh, reskilling uh, staff, and there will be program on uh, dialogue with IFIs in terms of the access uh, to financing. Alliance again will be present at the key global events so we're going uh, to start from today, from this meeting. Immediately in a few days, we will be at the World Future Energy Summit, uh, sharing our experiences. Then there will be annual investment meeting. We'll continue with uh, Upper Investment Forum, hopefully in Kenya in September. We're supporting the Hydrogen Forum in Singapore. And there will be New York Climate Week uh, as well. 
the usually tradition of the alliance is to have the annual meeting uh, by CEOs and by the partner organizations at the COP. So we're aiming to have a next meeting at the uh, COP uh, in Baku this year. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I gave you just highlight of the a lot of work uh, done the, uh, by Alliance last year and also what is uh, planned for, for this year. I will now give it back floor to, to David to open the, the panel discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Safar. Um, it's encouraging to see that the Alliance has already brought together so many large companies and that they're actually working together, that they're sharing best practices, that they're learning from each other, that they're working together to sign production agreements, but also offtake agreements. I'm David Franz. I co-lead Roland Berger's Global Sustainability Center of Excellence. And I'm joined here by several of the AFID members. Uh, on my right, we have Mr. Mohammed Osama, he's general manager of Taka Arabia. Mr. Manoj Kumar Singh, CEO of Net Zero Think. We've already introduced Mrs. Gauri Singh, the deputy director general. We have Mr. Kaladun Buasida, Managing Director of BASF Middle East. And on my left, we have Mr. Dimitrios Dimitriou, Vice President, ESG and Sustainability for Emirates Steel, Arkan, and Mr. Torsten Herdan, CEO of HIF EMEA. Thank you for being here. Dimitrios, let me start with you, because steel is one of those big industries some say it's roughly 2%, maybe 3% of global CO2 emissions. But you're one of the forerunners across the globe in actually decarbonizing the steel industry. Can you give a bit more flavor to that? What are you doing? And how do you see your competitiveness compared to others? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for being invited here. So actually, uh, let me take a step back and say that uh, uh, the company I'm representing uh, covers two uh, hard to abate sectors, uh, still, uh, and I will deep dive on uh, the actions that we've been taking already and uh, our plans going forward, as well as cement. So we have also a cement facility in Alain. So we cover, uh, let's say, two, uh, two big uh, industrial sectors in the UAE. Yeah, especially the cement, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. But let me start from uh, what we've been doing on the steel sector. So we have a 3.5 million tons uh, steel facility in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we were very fortunate when we uh, you know, uh, commissioned this facility more than 20 years ago uh, on the selection of our technology, which is based on natural gas DRI. And back in 2016, 17, we were the first ones and the only steel facility globally that uh, actually uh, captures a significant portion of its CO2 uh, in the order of 20 to 25 percent coming from the process side. Uh, and uh, obviously, given the relatively young age of the plant, we are quite energy efficient. And uh, we're also utilizing another uh, circular economy uh, lever, uh, which relates to using uh, recycled metal or scrap. Uh, which reduces, which comes with zero embedded carbon. Uh, but perhaps the area I would like to, uh, to focus on is something that uh, yeah, we've been doing recently with our partner uh, Mazda, which is uh, to be the first in the MENA region for steel uh, and used to test uh, a green hydrogen. So we're already in the process of uh, implementing a green hydrogen demonstration project. Uh, with the hydrogen that will be produced, uh, it will be uh, displacing a small portion of the natural gas that we're currently using uh, to uh, reduce the iron and then to produce uh, steel. Uh, this is the first step uh, to test uh, the technical aspects, the commercial aspects, as well as the certification aspects uh, of uh, this process and to produce uh, green steel, uh, hopefully hand in hand with an off-taker partner before we scale up to larger scale, which will be you know, the, the real step for uh, us to, uh, to meet our decarbonization goals. Maybe just a follow-up question directly on that. You talked about an off-take partner. It's what we're hearing everywhere when it comes to energy transition or industry decarbonization. It's also always about off-take. What is it that you need to secure that off-take? Uh, what is that we, that we need? Uh, I mean, we, 
first of all, we are very receptive into partnerships, yeah, uh, uh, traditionally, uh, both in uh, the UAE, evident by uh, partnering with uh, companies such as Mazda and AdNoc uh, on the energy supply side, yeah, as well on the CO2 supply from us to, uh, to companies like AdNoc, yeah. Uh, with regards to, uh, to offtake, you know, we're trying to develop uh, using the advantages of the country, which is uh, relatively low cost renewable energy, a solution that uh, will allow us and our uh, off takers, uh, which could be from the steel sector, uh, steel producers, that they're looking at using an intermediate material such as uh, DRI or HDI uh, to decarbonize their coal blast furnaces. As you know, most of the global capacity is based on coal. Uh, so we're trying to develop a competitive and attractive uh, uh, proposition. Uh, obviously, there is a gap because uh, the economics are still challenging. But you know, we want to work with partners, whether this is uh, from the government sector uh, or you know partners, uh, to uh, you know to, to, to take the first uh, step towards scaling up uh, in this direction. I want to move to Manoj. Um, you're from India. Um, Dimitrios talked about challenging economics. I know that European steelmakers are very much interested, but they're not yet signing these offtake agreements. In India, there's going to be massive increase in demand. I think there are plans to expand with 20 million tons capacity per year when it comes to steel. What do you see in, in India happening when it comes to economics of industry decarbonization? Do you see that there's a market developing? Yeah, uh, so in India, actually, if you look at uh, decarbonization is there since the beginning itself. So uh, per capita emission, if you look at, it's one of the least, you know, compared to other uh, developing and developed nations. So it is there since the beginning. Now, coming to industry decarbonization, that is also happening. Uh, uh, sectors like uh, renewable energy sector, which is, you know, growing very fast and re reducing the emissions in the grid. So, overall, if you look at, so, emissions from the grid is keep on reducing, which will helping industries, you know, to decarbonize their energy system. I'm talking about the grid side right now. So, and steel side also, steel industry wise also, I think all the major players, GSW, Tata, all the major players are taking actions. Uh, I think few of the members, a uh, few of the industries are the part of this FID, you know, members. So they are taking actions and things are moving, uh, you know, uh, at, at least uh, uh, higher level. Now coming to next, uh, next step, which is like, medium and small size industries, which is actually the core of, you know, uh, uh, sectors which need to be decarbonized. Uh, because without small and medium size, you know, industries decarbonization, uh, scope three emission reduction, what we are talking and what we are thinking to reduce, it's uh, very, very difficult. So uh, what need to be done now, uh, we have to focus on small and medium sizes, enterprises and helping them, handholding them, developing capacity, you know, uh, within them and uh, helping them to, you know, come up with uh, uh, at least starting doing, doing their emission measurement as a first step. So the first thing is like measuring emissions is the first step which is very much needed now. And the focus should be on MSME side uh, because large, I'm talking about steel sector, large players have already started this. Uh, now that need to be, you know, uh, come down to small and medium sized enterprises. So that is the first step, which is very, very critical right now. And then, you know, we have to look for reduction measures, which is like renewable energy, energy efficiency, integrating green hydrogen, you know, into, into systems. So those all things also need to be looked into. Uh, and the third thing is, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether this is the right place to talk or not, but carbon offset is also something we should start, you know, uh, thinking on and developing an ecosystem 
where that offset can help to increase you know decarbonization action so lots of policy level and regulations level intervention is needed actually if we really wanted to do decarbonization by using the tools of carbon so yeah this is a thing from my side thank you uh, mohammed you are into producing renewables and we were discussing that europe now producing let's say on the tens of megawatt maybe 100 megawatt scale what do you need to scale that to gigawatt scale because the whole general assembly is about tripling renewables to 11 terawatt that means we need to have parties that are developing at gigawatt scale yes uh, thank you for this question i think uh, as Zafar was speaking about, we, we need to think about uh, the enablers like the financing. We of course need a lot of financing that we are still uh, uh, not on, on the plan for the 1.5%. So we still need a lot of financing and we still also need to think where to put our finance. So still in Africa we need a lot of investment there. We still, even after uh, spending a trillion of dollars, uh, still Africa is uh, way behind this. So I believe uh, we need to put some uh, risk uh, mitigation plans to start focusing on, on investing in Africa and uh, putting a lot of investment there uh, to be able to meet our uh, 1.5 uh, target. Thank you. You mentioned financing gap, and honestly, in every discussion, every panel that I've been over the last few years when it comes to either energy transition or industry decarbonization, there's always talk about a financing gap. And then I wonder, is that really the case? Because there are trillions available. Is it not that there's just a business case gap? Because if there's a solid business case, I think financing is not the issue. I'm wondering, Torsten, how do you see that? Is there a business case to make money? Because if we can make money, it should not be too difficult. Or am I now oversimplifying things? <clears throat> Maybe. Yes. Um, I think when we are talking about decarbonization of industry, then we first have to understand that we do need to utilize carbon for decarbonizing the industry. And this then comes maybe to the point that decarbonization uh, is not the right word, it must either be defossilization. Um, and this is all on, on the business model and then on the financing gap. Because as long as the CO2 price is not really seen into all of the products, by whatsoever means, you cannot have a business case uh, and of course no money will flow in. What does it mean? I think um, when we look back in, I don't know what, 20, 25 years or so when we started up with renewables, we had the same situation. There was no business case because renewables were just too expensive at the very beginning. And then countries started up to create business cases. Like we in Germany with our renewable energy uh, law on the feed-in tariff, we did nothing else than produce a regulated off-taker. What we did was that every single electricity consumer in Germany was given the role of an off-taker, whether he wanted to off-take or not. He was obliged to pay 20 years for that renewable electron. So no problem with the business case. Very easy with all the wind parks, PV parks to go to the bank and say, here, I have an off-taker. Uh, he is obliged to be one, whether he wants or not, by law. Um, and now we are at the situation where renewables only, I call it that way, is some sort of a no-brainer. So to produce wind or PV, it's not really a, an issue because there is the business case. It but but, but just let me interrupt there. Because if it's not an issue, why are we having all these discussions that the challenge is to triple to 11 terawatt by 2030? Well, I think that is simply the point that uh, sometimes people have to understand that if you go on a, a growing rate uh, of, I don't know what, 30% every year, that uh, is, is nothing uh, any uh, industry can do. Yeah? Um, it doesn't uh, respect 
situations like we just had uh, with Russia, Ukraine, or still have, unfortunately. Um, but principally, it's not a problem what we see all, ar all over the world. So we have built a four under 480 megawatt uh, PV plant in the Atacama Desert. Not a problem. Not a problem. It's a no-brainer because it's cheap enough. But now it comes for industry decarbonization or industry defossilization to the point that we have to combine what we have in this um, AFID group, uh, the renewables, the CCUS, it is here on bioenergy, uh, and the hydrogen, uh, because we have to deliver to the industry hydrogen for steel, jet fuel for aviation, olefins for the chemical industry, and all sorts of things for the shipping. For the shipping, this is a huge amount uh, of hydrocarbons needed there if we really have to defossilize that. And this is, at this, as I said, the same situation than the renewables 20 years ago. Um, and in addition, there are some countries and regions in the world which put additional hurdles on all that stuff. And if I name Europe in that respect, Europe feels that it's... Um, not good to run the electrolyzer uh, on full load, but better to um, tell everything what is problematic to not use the electrolyzer on full load, meaning it has to be at the same time, it has to be additional renewable energy, blah, blah, blah. We all know all of that stuff. Um, and then we end up in a discussion, <clears throat> what we never had with renewables is the product green. If we were producing wind energy, or are we doing right now, or solar, it's clear, it's green. If we are producing hydrogen from wind energy, it's not clear whether it's green. If we are going further down the road for methanol, or for jet fuel, or for what type uh, olefins, we have to look what specifically we use in terms of CO2. We use cement CO2 inside of Europe, it's green, outside of Europe, unfortunately not. So all that is completely open, and if you then looking at FID for a certain project, and your off-taker asks you, can you assure that what you're producing right now will stay green over the lifetime of refinancing this project? And you say, I hope so. Okay, then FID is gone. And there is so much uh, on that that we have to understand um, that either we come to the point that we make it simple, I wouldn't say that we need a feed-in tariff uh, or feed-in law like we had for the renewables. Nobody can pay for that. But we need to make it more simple, otherwise the business case will not attract the money because the risk is simply too high. And let me put the very last point in. What has to be very clear, this uh, question on is it green, yes or no, and will it stay green, the product for the steel industry, blah, 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 will not work if legislators around the world are not fixing the regulation at the point of FID. So whatever this regulation looks like, whether it's good or bad, I don't care, but it has to be fixed at FID, and you have to be sure that for the next 20 years, this is what is valid for you. But you cannot take the risk that somebody comes along and just changes the regulation and your green product becomes gray. Nobody will invest in that, even if you have a business case. The risk is simply too high because somebody has to take the risk of the legislator. And good luck for that. So that's a very clear call for regulators to have clear and fixed policies. Khaldun was talking about olefins and you're a big chemical player. Um, would you be willing to offtake those green reproduced olefins for, with a 20-year offtake agreement uh, to decarbonize your operations? I mean, yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, BSF is, is not into olefins anymore. Uh, but, but speaking about offtake, yeah, we are evaluating a lot of opportunities for offtake. And we are uh, also investing in renewables. Uh, you know that we do have a 1.5 gigawatt wind farm in uh, Holland and um, 0 0.5 gigawatt in China belonging to us. So we are really investing into renewables, but also into CO2 abatement, uh, participating into the CO2 grid in Europe, because if you don't have a grid uh, for carbon capture, it's, it makes no sense. So you, you, you really need to start. Um, so for us, it's very important. Um, and of course, the, the third pillar is uh, circularity. Uh, whenever we need uh, raw material, we think twice. And um, I joined then the colleague from uh, um, HIF. So for any business case, if you don't close the loop 
And if you don't think about scope one, two, and three, uh, the business case will not fly. So you have really to take a holistic view in any new investment. Uh, but we are not shy in doing it. Eh? And uh, we really invest a lot in uh, new technologies and innovation regarding uh, CO2 abatement, renewables, and circularity. And do you then use internally something like a CO2 pricing? Um, I mean, we invented this uh, famous Verbund, which means that in our production site in Germany or in Antwerp, uh, the two in US and the two in China, uh, it's it's closed system. That means internally, whatever uh, a, a unit is producing, we have firstly to find out if it's usable inside this Verbund. Yeah? So it's circularity and, and using the energy, I mean, steam is used in a lot of uh, other departments or uh, plants. So this is already anchored. But you're right, it's not, is it sufficient? No. This is why I see here around us a lot of net zero, net zero technology center, think, etc. Our department name is net zero accelerator within BSF. Why? Because we see that we are not doing enough. We have really to accelerate the path. I'm wondering, Torsten, um, you mentioned CO2 pricing. Can you delve a bit more on that? What would you expect from governments there? Um, I was talking on CO2 in uh, mainly two issues. First of all, we need a lot of CO2 to put it into the hydrogen in order to supply the industry with renewable hydrocarbons. That we have to understand first. And this CO2 costs a lot of money. So we are paying for a ton of CO2, depending uh, what our projects, be it in the US or in Chile or in Uruguay, a different price. So we are paying for CO2 to get it there, right? So uh, it's between something like 300 euros, um, the ton of CO2, or if we will use a point source, which is not allowed in the US, then we are maybe at about 60 or so euros. So that is what we pay for it. So a CO2 market is coming up. And the other point, of course, uh, but I think this is, this is tackled already, uh, is the CO2 pricing mechanism like in Europe with the ETS and other, other means. Um, but we have to understand that the end user also has to be part of the game. So if we uh, think on shipping, it has to be clear that whatever it is, the Amazon good has to pay uh, if it is transported uh, CO2 low, I wouldn't say free because there is nothing CO2 free on Earth, right? Um, um, if you are flying a plane, uh, you have to pay for that, um, for the CO2. If you are doing a cruise, uh, you have to pay for that, uh, and, and, and so those we have to put into the game, uh, as it was done in the Renewable Energy Act uh, with the electricity consumer. So the end consumer has to pay for the burden they are putting on Earth. Is there anyone here at the table that would like to give kind of a put a price to that CO2? How much does it need to be before all these big investments take place? It, it, you mentioned we're now paying 300 euros. Um, I think many consumers and many politicians would get a bit scared if we would talk about 300 euro per ton of CO2. What is a realistic price? I would say that it is also very much different in a different region. Uh, taking another example, we are right now building a, a duck um, proof of concept unit, so a direct air capture unit in Germany, which we then ship to Chile and um, install it in our uh, pilot plant, Haroni. Um, and then we are producing out of wind with direct air uh, captured CO2 uh, gasoline. Um, there we are targeting at something like $200 the ton of CO2. If we can do it for this and scale up, this would be perfect because then we can do it elsewhere in the world, right? Uh, this would then be a game changer. But I think it has nothing to do um, what somebody has to pay if he or she is flying from A to B. I was, I was a month ago or so flying to, to Helsinki, from Berlin to Helsinki. I paid uh, 110 euros for a flight to Helsinki and back. That is impossible. That cannot work. The CO2 price must be even higher. So I think we all have to understand that uh, what we are doing, we can further on do it, but we have to pay for that. But to exactly name the price, I think that's very different in the region. D Dimitrios, you make steel, DRI, CH4-based. 
So your CO2 emissions per ton of steel is probably around one ton per ton of steel. Uh, it's close, you're close, right? It's a little bit less than that, actually, our intensity. So that makes it quite competitive with what's being produced in Europe. And then I'm thinking of carbon border adjustment mechanism. Do you there see a big growth market for yourself? Uh, we are exporting currently uh, uh, part of our uh, products, uh, production to, to Europe, a small part, yeah, especially the value-added products. So for us, uh, CBAN is very relevant. And, uh, uh, you know, although there are some, you know, it's an evolving regulation and an evolving uh, landscape on the CBAM side, so there are still a few uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, we currently uh, using here, which are the only available mechanisms, such as, uh, uh, you know, our ability, uh, actually, regulation here doesn't allow for entering into direct PPAs between, uh, let's say, uh, end users, such as us, and renewable ener energy producers, uh, which is clearly uh, not uh, in line of, uh, with CBAM, yeah? Uh, regardless, you know, uh, you know, as you said, we are uh, one of the lowest uh, carbon intensity, uh, uh, let's say, steel integrated steel producers, because we, you know, our peers, or most of them are based on coal, uh, coal blast furnaces. Obviously, you have the fully, uh, 100% uh, scrap players that, you know, they, they, they have even lower carbon intensity than us. So what I'm trying to say is that, uh, uh, yes, we can use our position uh, to, uh, uh, and our, our good position in terms of uh, uh, carbon intensity to, uh, to look at Europe uh, as one of our key markets. I think where the, our advantage will mainly come, especially when, when looking at the European market, is uh, uh, decoupling uh, really uh, the iron and steel production and focusing on the, the DRI, HPI side. This is where our real advantage is because we are closer to the source of our competitive advantage as, uh, as a country, which is on the renewable energy side. And uh, we keep the hydrogen, we embed it into the HPI product, which is transported uh, very easily. Uh, to uh, to Europe, to to Asia, etc. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to be a bit critical when it comes to the Alliance for Industry Decarbonization. So far, you you showed great ambitions, uh, nearly tripling the amount of renewables, etc. And then, if you hear the actual concrete plans, and I'm just looking at the table, what can the alliance members do, or what should governments do to help the alliance members actually make the big investments? So because we're talking tens of billions in technologies that at the moment don't yet always have a business case, because that's what I'm hearing. You know, Dimitrios, your business case seems to be one of the few that is starting to make sense. What are the thoughts? Anyone wants to react to that? Manush, please. Yeah, for investment, actually, uh Everyone looks for, you know, returns <laughs> and that also long term, you know, uh, clarity also. So the new technology is what we are talking, green hydrogen, carbon capture storage, uh, renewable energy, uh, new technologies. Uh, everything is related to huge, everything is, ha you know, uh, is having uh, or it's needed, you know, lots of investment into this. Now, how an investor can get return of that which is assured also because everyone is looking just i was talking to someone uh, today um, uh, so they are saying green lots of you know green hydrogen mous are being signed from last uh, 3 4 years but on actual you know nothing is there on ground everything is there on paper everyone is thinking the price of electrolyzer will come down and it will become, you know, less than $1 or less than $1.5, then we'll be setting up the project. Be why? Because they are not sure if suppose they set up their project today, whether they will be able to get, you know, benefit or they will be able to get the returns what they're expecting. So that clarity is not there today. But coming to the point, 
how that clarity can come if the regulations and policies are in place while we are talking about adding renewable energy or in increasing energy efficiency because we wanted to cut greenhouse gas emissions this is the purpose everyone is working you know for that why we are promoting renewable energy because we wanted to reduce carbon emissions because energy is there conventional fossil fuels are there which is so solving for purpose of you know energy requirement but it's having carbon into that that need to be reduced so for that renewable energy or energy efficiency are the majors you know which will over the period of time reduce this emission so purpose is to reduce the emissions but the market for reducing the emissions in terms of carbon is not clear so if suppose that clarity comes ki whatever emissions we are reducing for that you know there will be market with that you know uh, uh, will be able to get uh, uh, the returns what we are in investing today people will be happy to invest today so that article 6 uh, paris agreement need to be you know clarified as soon as possible if we really wanted you know decarbonization to happen in the industry so this is from my side yeah thank you um yes as we've been working with companies and uh, these are the leading companies on the market they participate in the alliance and what we estimated that collectively they're going to multiply by 2.5 and we're aiming to triple by 2030 but if you look at the other companies on the market probably the figures will be much less so obviously we need to make a, a major leap in terms of uh, advancing uh, the progress at the company level half of the alliance members have the carbonization strategy in place and made them public but half still have not done so so another thing is that at the company level uh, there is an urgent need to have a clear decarbonization strategy with the uh, interim milestones and backup by investment in the years to come on the government side a lot of countries now go to the net zero and the country hosting us here by 2050 which means all the companies on the market present here need to support and work with the government to make sure that we deliver the net zero by 2050 so this is obviously collaboration of the uh, industries private sector and the governments and, and all uh, stakeholders working together Collectively, the industry made a huge advances in terms of technology. Solar, wind, the, the cost uh, reduced a lot. And it is the ingenuity of the business sector and the, the government support and regulation that wasn't put in place. And I believe in the years to come, we have to do the same with other technologies, which is out there. We mentioned today the green hydrogen. We're going to work on the bioenergy with C3S. We will bring the technology cost down and this technology will be commercially attractive and available. And the whole, uh, the, the platform of the Alliance actually provides the space to do it together and faster. Because individually, it's really difficult to, to address all this topic. Collectively, it's, it's much better and we can go faster. So this is what we're trying to do, to bring technologies, to bring companies together, the partners, that they can go faster because this is the cake of the action. So we need to deliver by 2030. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, thank you, Safar. You, you mentioned bioenergy and CCS, and then I'm thinking of Torsten, you're investing in direct air capture, but bioenergy and CCS, so it gives you biogenic CO2. Is that one of the big things that you can use to further advance your business? Yeah, first of all, to suffer, I think this alliance is perfect because um, everybody who's walking alone um, realizes very fast that it's better to walk with others together, right? Uh, um, many looking on the pathway uh, help not to go the wrong way. First thing. Second, um, yes and no. Um, so very often you have a lot of renewable energies, so an abundance of renewable energies in areas where nobody, nobody's living uh, or where nothing is growing, right? Uh, if we look uh, into the UAE, very typical for that. Uh, if you take Morocco uh, as another example, if you take the Oman, if you take south of Chile, if you take Australia, so very often when the sun is shining heavily or the wind is blowing heavily or both together, people don't like to live there and plants don't like to grow. 
So very often you don't have biogenic resources at the same place where you have the renewables in abundance. And now comes the question how to get the CO2 there. And yes, you can bring the CO2 there. I'm pretty sure that we will see, and that's also something we discuss in the Alliance, a CO2 trading system around the world because CO2 becomes a, an added value in order to deploy renewables in areas where otherwise they would never be deployed because the people which are not living there do not need any electricity. And there is no infrastructure that you get that electricity away. And there is no infrastructure that you get the hydrogen away. But it's easy to get away hydrocarbons. You can also do ammonia, of course, but we cannot flood the world with ammonia. Uh, there is uh, still some need of hydrocarbons in the world. So that is where direct air capture comes into the game. And uh, it is like Bertrand Picard, I was at the master meeting this morning, uh, said, um, I'm always uh, told that this is not possible. And then I'm starting to work uh, because uh, we get the best people uh, for the very complicated things. Uh, the lazy ones, they are getting doing the simple project. So we got a lot of really great people for the direct air capture uh, approach because also people say, this is not possible, that's too expensive, there's only 400 ppm in the air, and blah, blah, blah. So I think if we can demonstrate that this is possible and integrate it into a process, then yes, we can and should uh, use biogenic CO2 to bridge. There is not enough available in the world, uh, and we cannot take it away from the food sector and anything else. We must be careful with biogenic CO2, very careful. And what I would also like to add is we should use the point sources as a bridge. Taking again an example of Morocco, you have in the southern parts of Morocco the best renewable uh, resources I can think of. There is wind and sun in abundance. But there is no CO2 unless you take CO2 from a cement industry. They have huge cement industry like Lafarge. Europe says you cannot use that. Better you blow the CO2 in the air and you don't deploy renewables, then deploy renewables, put the CO2 in and uh, deliver us uh, hydrocarbons, renewable ones, to Europe. This is something where we have to understand that we have to bridge into this energy transition. And there the CO2 on the point source is extremely important. So not only look at uh, biogenic CO2 and direct air capture, I'm pretty sure will come, but it's not here today. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, the audience also for some interventions. I've received some beforehand. Um, Craig Nicole from Net Zero Technology Center. I'm looking forward to your views. My own. So thanks very much for the invite to come along today. We, uh, by a quick introduction, we just signed um, uh, the agreement to be within the AFID last week. So thank you very much for welcoming me here today. We were um, established in 2017 in the UK with government money to accelerate the net zero um, targets of the UK by implementing new technologies. We focused solely on hydrocarbon technologies for, for, for a start for the first few years, but then we rapidly uh, changed into the integration into a new clean energy mix. Now that's been really interesting. Um, we have aspirations now. We celebrated nearly our seventh birthday last year and we are now looking to take the benefits realization that we have achieved with the, with the government money in the UK to, 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 to um, take it on a global stage. Setting up uh, in the UAE is, is our first global um, um, expansion and an introduction to the FID uh, has been a very welcomed one because we share, uh, uh, share the sole commitments that we, that we want to achieve. So being very new, I've, I've been really interested uh, in, in hearing the first panel, the sessions, etc. But a few takeaways, I've been taking some notes um, for, from, from the discussions that have been, been said, that, and it chimes with what we've seen through the seven years that we've already been trying to implement this, very much on a technology-centered uh, approach. But 
we speak about the carbon offset uh, credits um, as being one thing, the availability of the renewables being another, the, the areas and the demand, and it becomes uh, you know, a spaghetti junction of, of questions and, 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 and causes and impacts of, of if you implement one, it's going to, to have an adverse effect on something else. So we are still of the belief that technology is in its infancy. So uh, forums such as these are absolutely critical to, to, to stand together to start accelerating the development of this. We have been looking at, uh, looking at renewable energy for 20, 30 years, however, not aggressively um, and not with the same uh, mindset and business case that has been mentioned a lot. This is now critical. Um, we are now trying to offset hydrocarbons. We like to say it within NZTC, we're, we're complementing the hydrocarbons. Uh, we need to decarbonize the hydrocarbon production because it's not going away overnight. Uh, if you switched it off, we would have a serious, serious problem. So how can we blend, uh, blend the new renewable technologies, etc., into an energy mix? So not answering many questions, but an observation. Um, however, I truly believe that the, the, the six pillars that we have in place here in the AFID are going to make a difference. And joining as a knowledge partner, I can't wait to get involved in, in seeing if we can achieve some improvements. Thank you, Craig. I, I'm wondering, I'm going to invite uh, Joe Tyndall of the OECD, because there's been some talk here about what governments can do. And what international kind of coordinated action do you see as being required, but also what is actually possible to really advance industry decarbonization? Oh, well, thanks very much. This has uh, been a, a, a still a, a really interesting discussion, um, learning uh, a lot here. Um, and first of all, try to, to think about, well, why is international coordination uh, necessary here? And I think the sheer number of uh, associations, alliances, and groupings that uh, we've seen even in the room today uh, are testament to, to the fact that everybody does think uh, there's value in, in working together. I think it's essential because, well, we've got a collective problem for a start off, but uh, industry actors operate across uh, uh, global value chains, so the stakeholders really need to be brought together to try and find solutions. A lot of the industrial activity that needs to be decarbonized has a very long life cycle. So there's a short window to invest in, in the green alternatives that are there. And I think in, in this area, as in so many other aspects of the various environmental challenges that are facing the world at the moment, forging, we're all forging new pathways to solve what is a collective problem. So it definitely makes sense to solve it together, to make it a whole of government exercise, and that's a big thing for the OECD, which is a multidisciplinary organization that covers all aspects of, of government, make it multi-stakeholder and uh, apply systems thinking to find uh, solutions. So I think we've touched on, the, the, the panel have touched on a number of aspects uh, where cooperation is needed and where governments have a role to um, a larger or, or lesser extent. First of all, there's technology and innovation where there's underinvestment uh, at the moment uh, in the new technologies that need to come to the market for us to, to get to net zero. Second, and this is a big area for uh, the OECD, the standards and guidelines, the spaghetti bowl um, that is there at the moment as people are struggling uh, to try and understand scope one, scope two, let alone scope three, and a whole pile of uh, regulatory uh, issues uh, around that. So uh, a lot of that is government, uh, but things like pricing and financial risks are clearly uh, the job of, of um, uh, industry itself. The next area is policy, which is a little bit different from regulation, um, and it includes peer learning, which I think is again being touched on as a super important part when uh, no one person uh, has all the answers. 
And the last and biggest thing is financing. Financing, I absolutely agree. Uh, there's plenty of money floating around in the system, um, but there are so many calls on it, even within the environment area, uh, that it's it's becoming almost impossible to to um, even understand the barriers first uh, before coming up with uh, the solutions to how to redirect uh, that finance towards uh, um, clean energy, net zero uh, friendly solutions. Um, if I've got, uh, can crave your indulgence, I'll just mention two, three very quick examples of things the OECD is involved with. We would be very keen to work with uh, the Alliance for Industry Decarbonisation uh, in, in things in the future. First of all is an inclusive forum on carbon mitigation approaches, and that's very much a, a government level one. Looking uh, um, at it's got 58 members currently, doing a stop taking of policies associated with um, mitigating the impacts of, of climate change uh, and uh, using economic modelling tools to assess uh, their effectiveness as well as providing an inclusive forum uh, for dialogue and, and peer learning. Um, and that's been going for a year. Secondly, the Climate Club launched uh, at a political level at COP28 last year. Um, the Climate Club, uh, the OECD along with the IEA is pro providing an interim secretariat for. It's currently got 38 members and it's trying to do four things. It's very much focused on industry decarbonisation, so a good fit with, uh, um, with the work the AFID is doing. Looking to support collective action, to uh, work towards a common understanding of effective decarbonisation policies, um, uh, being a platform for high-level political exchange and cooperating on a bilateral and multilateral level, uh, including to support developing countries. And the last quick one I want to mention touches more on the financing side. This is CEFM, the Clean Energy Financing Investment Mobilisation program. Second is much easier to say. Um, and that uh, is a, um, a program run through the OECD where we work closely with governments, industry and financial institutions in emerging markets and developing economies to find market and financing solutions for decarbonisation technologies. Three examples, working with Egypt on clean hydrogen for industry, in Indonesia on steel and textiles, uh, South Africa on steel, and a fourth example, Thailand on petrochemicals and plastic value chains. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, and I'm actually going to ask a follow-up question. You mentioned financing several times, and here in the panel that was also one of the, one of the pain points. What's your view on ideas when it comes to carbon pricing? That's a big question. Um, carbon pricing, yes, uh, obviously it's a, um, I, I think it's, it's a fundamental and, and growing tool. And now there's two aspects to carbon pricing. So there's government pricing, a carbon tax or carbon markets, such as the ETS in, in Europe, but also um, pricing within uh, the private sector. And there are uh, uh, compliance markets using the, the government traded uh, um, permits, and uh, voluntary markets with the, the private sector directly involved. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, they are an essential part of the solution, absolutely essential. What is done with the um, money that is uh, collected through the application of carbon taxes or, or carbon markets is, is a different question altogether. And I know that some governments um, have kind of managed to get the political buy-in to introduce these things by promising to plough that money, or at least some of it, back into affected communities. Um, but there are possibly other uh, um, solutions that need to be talked about. The only thing I'd add is that most governments have uh, found that reliance solely on um, a carbon market or carbon pricing is not going to get them to net zero, not going to do so fast enough because the, the prices 
um, are not going high enough and don't always work depending on the sector. So uh, they're complementing carbon pricing with other regulatory approaches. I'll give an example of a client that we're actually working for in the Netherlands at the moment. It's a very large industrial corporation and they asked us to calculate what is actually the cost of decarbonizing of four different pathways that they had. And all four of them, the outcome was very clear. It's uneconomical for them to decarbonize. And then yesterday, the Dutch government announced that in 2030, there will be a CO2 tax of 216 euros. And suddenly, three out of those four decarbonization roadmaps all become economical. And suddenly, they want to continue with those. But before that, even the ETS, the uncertainty of the ETS and forecasts of around 100 euros per ton in 2030 didn't make any of those four decarbonization roadmaps economical. Um, from the delegation of the Republic of Korea, Mrs. Sheng Sung Kim. Thank you. Uh, Korea is uh, actively implementing its uh, decarbonization roadmap to become a first mover in decarbonizing in the industrial sector. However, uh, with the industrial sector accounting for 55%, um, the energy consumption in Korea, uh, we are facing challenges in decarbonizing in the industrial sector. Currently, efforts such as electrification, expansion of non-carbon power sources, and the training of uh, specialized personnel are being implemented to decarbonize the industrial sector. The first thing, electrification involves converting partial fuel combustion process to electrically powered systems. Hydro hydrogen and ammonia power generation are also an alternative. But so far, they are still in the beginning stages. Uh, second thing is an expansion of carbon-free power sources. We are promoting uh, greenhouse gas reduction by utilizing non-carbon power sources, such as renewable energy and uh, nuclear power. Thank you. Thank you very much, and great to hear that also for Korea, the basis of the industry or decarbonizing industry is a lot of extra electrification. That's the base, be it directly with, by electrons or indirectly via green molecules. And Mrs. Tala Abu Jukar from ADNOC. Hello, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, meeting. This is our first meeting as ADNOC with the Alliance. Uh, it's a great opportunity to meet everyone and work together uh, towards the Alliance targets. Um, I would like to address two things here. Uh, everyone is talking about finance and how we can make things more economic um, and, uh, um, let's say, um, encourage uh, companies uh, to, uh, to finance and um, uh, technologies. Um, I will talk from climate change point of view. It's important not to think about what we were what we are uh, spending today, we need to look into how much it will cost us tomorrow, the inaction of decarbonization of today and how much it will cost us tomorrow. This is something that we always forget. Uh, what will be the damage and the cost for our sector after 20, 30 years? So this is something that we always distance ourselves from thinking about because we think it's not in the near future. We're not, um, it, it won't touch us, but it is touching all of the sectors and all of the future economics. So this is one part that we need always to think when we talk about economics and financing the technology. The other part, which is uh, from our experience with an ad hoc, how we can create and encourage more financing for the technologies. So we, we believe that there, there should be more inclusive ecosystem where all of the sectors could work together. Uh, yes, private sector, they have a very important uh, part. Uh, they sit at the center of this uh, ecosystem, but we need academia. We need uh, the public sector and their policies, enablers, uh, uh, 
to, to achieve these targets. We need also the startups. So each part of these uh, players, they have a role. And with all of them together, we can translate theories to applications and tools that they serve the policies and foster economy. So we believe if the private sector find uh, the right technology that serves the local economy, they will be encouraged more to finance and uh, work with other players to make it growing and fostering. So this is from, um, from our experience, but we're talking about small part. Now together we can make it maybe more inclusive and we can learn from, from each other. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else who would like to make an intervention? Then I'd like to invite the panelists for their last comments. Yeah. I mean, thanks uh, again. Um, I like this um, cost of uh, inaction. Yeah, because this is really what matters. I mean, in the next 10 to 20 years, what will happen for our kids? What will happen for future generations? And I mean, thanks for enlightening me, because this is something very um, critical. What I can tell you is, from our uh, company uh, point of view, which is 165 years old, it matters a lot. So we think about future generation, we think about what will happen, what is the next step, because if we don't do it, I mean, we will most probably have big troubles, especially our kids. So again, thanks a lot for uh, this. Okay. Manoj. Yeah, so, uh, my comment is just start measuring, work for reduction and removal, and if it is not possible, try to offset it. So this is a way with that we should approach, and it will help, you know, uh, in industry decarbonization. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, I speak briefly about the financing, as we all know that it is a key for uh, decarbonization. We all know that the money is there in the banks, but the idea is we need uh, to focus on our target and work on the regulations and policies that make it uh, practical to, uh, to invest these numbers in decarbonization. Thank you. Thorsten. <clears throat> we, can, we can only show to in that case, the regulators, where the business case is lacking a business case. Um, we have to start up uh, when it comes to more than deploy those renewables where the electricity can easy be, easily be used. In order to really deploy the vast majority of yet not deployed renewables in the world. Um, and for this, we need to have front runners, and I can only encourage more companies to join the alliance, um, and then also learn from it, each other. So, like we spent 80 million euros without any subsidy to produce 130,000 liters, liters of gasoline a year. This is nothing. So we just said we do it. I think that is more that people and companies just do it, and then we can do it together. I see there's an intervention request from Unido. Yes, thanks. You went very quick from asking. I was too late to respond to that. But first of all, Unido is very happy to be part of the knowledge partners of the Alliance, and we have been collaborating with the members uh, in the last year, also contributing to publications. But I wanted to go back to the last point made on the regulator and the importance of making sure there is a, is a manageable risk uh, in the industry. Uh, so Unido is really looking forward to strengthening the collaboration uh, amongst others through a new initiative that we're working on, which is Partnership for Net Zero Industries. Uh, and that's really focused on supporting countries in establishing a regulatory environment that is uh, incentivizing investments in, in decarbonization technologies. Um, so doing capacity building of governments uh, and at the same time working with private sector companies uh, here by creating a pipeline of, of investable projects as well. Um, 
So really looking forward to strengthening the collaboration as a knowledge partner with the Alliance and thanks again. Great to have you on board. I see there's one other request. Sorry, I also missed my chance because I thought that, you know, uh, the chance was too quick. I'm Shorbujit from the Clean Energy Ministerial Secretariat uh, and just wanted to kind of convey that uh, it's been really uh, heartening to see the progress that has been made by um, the coalition in the last couple of years. I was there at the launch in Bali and uh, since then I think uh, a significant amount of work has been done. From the Clean Energy Ministerial side, and this relates uh, a bit, uh, uh, David, to your point with regards to what governments are doing and leading uh, already, uh, there are a large number of initiatives, including uh, the Industrial Deep Decarbonization Initiative, which uh, UNIDO is helping you know, coordinate uh, for the uh, Clean Energy Ministerial, where we have um, much of the, you know, initially what we had discussed, the uh, pull effect, uh, where we have been kind of discussing uh, with member governments who have already committed to uh, public procurement goals uh, that they are starting to kind of set before themselves. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we are also working very closely with the governments to uh, determine uh, among the two sectors which uh, IDDI is now focusing on, cement as well as steel. Uh, starting with the steel sector, a lot of uh, work is happening on assessment of uh, uh, standards, uh, which would be helpful uh, you know, to answer the questions with regards to how green, uh, uh, green actually is. And we are collaborating with uh, uh, the International Standards Organization to kind of support much of that work. We have uh, across uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial several other initiatives uh, focused on uh, sustainable fuels like biofuels uh, and on clean hydrogen on which of course we have a significant amount of uh, industry engagement and participation. Uh, as we do have also, you know, connecting this demand to the uh, uh, supply a uh, new initiative which was launched last year called the Clean Energy Marine Hubs, which is also a government and private sector uh, uh, collaborative effort. Uh, and across all of these things, um, you know, we would see that, you know, with the uh, um, Alliance for Industry Decarbonization, uh, there is good amount of, you know, potential to uh, identify opportunities for collaboration. And noting the fact that, you know, IRENA is now coordinating the Secretariat, we would be looking forward to uh, you know, see how we can kind of build a strong partnerships across many of these various clean energy ministerial initiatives which are focusing on industry decarbonization uh, aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more first from IEC. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, the word standards has been mentioned several times. I would like to underline that many, many standards exist. So tr let's not try to reinvent the wheel. And the second thing is that um, we also have ways of uh, verifying declarations around net zero. Um, there are standards that allow to have net zero declarations that are comparable from one declaration to the next. Here too, it's very important that not every industry comes up with their own way of measuring what net zero is. Thank you. Thank you. In Nigeria. So, uh, a brief question. That's uh, one matter raised by Mr. Is it Tarak or Arabia or so, on why Africa is not getting enough investment. So I was waiting for some kind of detailed responses. And it reminds me of the position that Africa produces a little over 60% of the raw materials that are needed for whether renewables or other industrial materials. And it meets below 4% of the global emissions and receives far below 2% or so of investment. So I would like the panel, maybe if not now, at some other time, to devote a little more time in discussing these concerns about Africa. If truly we are talking about uh, decarbonization and, of course, a just and equitable way of transiting uh, um, away from the challenges that we are facing. Because if you juxtapose these factors and put them together, it doesn't seem as if Africa is really in the calculations and um, judgments of some of the people who have uh, been making the policies. 
So I, I, I think that it deserves little more attention if we are talking about just and equitable transition. Thank you. Thank you for that important intervention. I'm wondering, is anyone on the panel willing to speak up about what is actually required to also make sure that industry decarbonization and investments in energy transition should also happen in Africa? Gabriela. So maybe there is one way of going around it. There is a lot of industrialization happening still. There's a lot of stuff that we can do in Africa. One of the recommendations would be to use international standards, to adopt them, to, to, to use certification, testing and certification, so that you get to a minimum energy efficiency level that will already reduce the need to decarbonize on the one side. On the other side, investments, when they are based on international standards, a lot of times you get more confidence of investors that their investment will be for the long run and that whatever is being put in place is actually durable, can be maintained and can be repaired. So these are two aspects that are probably underused by many African countries who could be using this because they are uh, often unbeknownst of the government level participating in international standardization organizations. I think uh, uh, okay. uh, going to go over and above that. The reason I'm going to stress this is because a lot of the developed uh, countries and uh, in fact the industrialized countries uh, hesitate for some maybe economic or whatever reasons in coming to invest in Africa. But they also do not hesitate when they are looking for the raw materials. But the other side is when we privatize our telecommunications industry, we beg them to come. I'm talking of Nigeria now as a case in point. They did not come, but those who came are still smiling to the bank still today. So it's just a matter of people reconsidering how their perceptions have been. I think I know exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. And these are elements that the Alliance for Industry Decarbonization should definitely take on in future sessions. Thank you for that. Uh, Dimitrios, do you have some closing remarks? Uh, to highlight perhaps uh, the importance of uh, leadership uh, in this uh, discussion, and sometimes uh, taking a leap of faith, especially uh, uh, at the start, yeah, like starting small, perhaps with a demonstration a concepts, which might not, not the definition of demonstration, I guess it's, it's not commercial uh, business case, but uh, just by having something on the ground, then you also uh, motivate and engage with uh, the broader spectrum of stakeholders uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, create this momentum to scale up, you know. Uh, so I think, again, uh, collaboration was mentioned before. I think it's critical. And uh, it's really uh, nice to see that uh, we have a lot of members in this alliance. And uh, hopefully we can expand even further and we can accelerate towards uh, meeting uh, our targets. Thank you. I'm going to summarize and I'm going to close this discussion. I've been encouraged today by many things. The first thing that I was encouraged by was this morning. In every country that I travel, when I am in a taxi, I speak to the taxi driver to get a sense of the cultural feeling, the political feelings. Today, the taxi driver from Pakistan told me very clearly, and this is the first time I've heard that, climate change is happening. We hear it now outside. That's encouraging, because if these people are also saying that this is happening, that eventually will guide our politicians. The second thing that encouraged me today is what I've seen here. All the technologies to decarbonize and have a good energy transition, they're there. We know what to do. The ambition is there, and I think there's also a clear wish from the panel for governments to be clear, 
but also to be very consistent in their policies, because that will allow businesses to flourish and to make the transition. Thank you very much for your attention.